I would like to introduce you to Dr. Janet Canoto. She is a professor and extension entomologist at North Dakota State University, which is in Fargo, North Dakota. For the last 22 years, she has provided statewide program leadership for extension, extension entomology and the North Dakota Integrated Pest Management, or IPM, program. Her extension outreach and applied research focuses on insect pests of field crops, gardens, and also she works with pollinators. She has authored or co-authored more than 300 publications in professional extension, technical, and trade journals, including over 50 peer-reviewed papers and five book chapters. So we're delighted to have you here to give us a little sunshine in our day and the current <laughs> environment we're living in. So thank you very much and take it away. Uh, well, th thank you, Julie, very much. And I um, always look forward to doing webinars with you. Uh, just a little background on myself. Um, I am an avid pollinator gardener, and I live out in the country now, so I have plenty of room to put in gardens, and I put in, in a garden just about every year. I've been out there for about five years now, and I just really enjoy it. It's so rewarding uh, when you get a new pollinator or butterfly that comes to your garden. It's just so exciting. And I just find it very stress, stress relieving as well when I'm out there working in my garden. So it's just a tremendous amount of fun. <laughs> and I guess I'm hoping this webinar will, if you're not already a gardener and butterfly gardener, I hope it will instill in you um, to get going. So what is a butterfly? Its name actually came from Britain. Uh, there's a European sulfur butterfly, which are yellow in color, and the Britons would see them flying in the woodlands in the early spring, and they called them butter. They look like little pieces of butter flying around. <laughs> so that's how the name originated. <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting uh, to look into where some of these names come from in the insect world. Um, and they belong in taxonomically, they belong to the order Lepidoptera, and Lepta means scaly, and Terra means wing. And most butterflies you can easily identify, besides being so beautiful and colorful, is they have clubbed antennae, slender body, bodies, and are flying around during the day. And another interesting thing is to look at their wings under a microscope. If you have a chance, you'll see the scales on their wings. And they have an amazing number, 125,000 per square inch. And some of them are just beautiful, especially some of the iridescent colors. Um, they just glow under the microscope. So if you have a chance, uh, please look at them under the, the wings underneath a microscope. First, I thought I'd cover a little bit about the life cycle of butterflies. Um, most of them have one generation uh, per year, or once, we'll see them once a year, but there are some that have multiple generations. It just depends on the species of butterfly. And I'm using our uh, monarch butterfly as an example here. Uh, it's a uh, popular butterfly, so I thought I'd uh, primarily use this. And butterflies actually go through uh, four different life stages. They go from egg to caterpillar or larvae, to chrysalis or pupae, to a winged adult. And we call this process complete metamorphosis. And it usually begins, you know, in the overwintering stage here in North Dakota where it's cold um, in the spring when it starts to warm up. And insects have a lot of different ways of adapting to our cold temperatures here and for overwintering. So some of them overwinter as eggs, others as larvae, some as chrysalis, and rarely as winged adults here in North Dakota. <laughs> Obviously, we're too cold for most butterflies as adults to overwinter. 
So if we start with the um, adult stage, uh, for the monarch, they can live two to five weeks, except when they're migrating. This this species obviously migrates, as you know. So then they they are longer lived, up to eight months. Uh, but typically, the female will mate soon after she uh, emerges, and then she'll seek out a proper host plant to deposit her eggs on. And she's some. Butterflies are very selective and they only have one major host plant like the monarch butterfly. They like the uh, milkweeds for their host plant, but others have a broader host range. So it just depends. So anyway, she searches for her host plant and she tries to find a healthy looking plant for the caterpillar to develop on. So then the eggs will hatch in a few days and the caterpillars will emerge from the eggs and there are eating machines. You can see the uh, young caterpillar in the top picture. It's eating the egg shell for nutrition and they continue to grow and as they grow they have to pass through these growth stages we call instars and with each growth or instar stage they have to molt their skin or their exoskeleton so they can grow more. So you might see on leaves and other plant tissues, you might actually see the cast skins of uh, caterpillars. It's similar to the cast skins of um, aphids, if you're familiar with that. So the caterpillar stage can last from quite a long time, a week to several months, depending on the species. For the monarch, it's 10 to 14 days. Then when it's mature, it'll go through a pupil, a resting stage. And for butterflies, we call this the chrysalis. And it's about 10 to 14 days uh, for the monarch. And then this is an amazing stage because the caterpillar transforms into the adult butterfly in this stage. So if you look at the larvae and then the adult butterfly, it's just amazing the transformation that occurs. The butterfly will start to split the chrysalis open and it slowly starts to crawl out and then it expands the wings by pumping blood into them. And then they need to dry for an hour or two before they're ready to fly off. So it's a, a fairly long process, an involved process, but a um, lot of uh, butterflies um, need to need need to go through this and find host plants in order to successfully um, uh, reproduce. Some butterflies migrate into North Dakota, like the monarch and the variegated fritillary. Um, others are native here and they'll overwinter. And as, uh, as you know, butterflies need to visit flowers for a sugary source. That's their energy. And then they also need to find water to prevent dehydration. And there are some exceptions to that, and I'll talk about that in the woodland uh, butterflies. So and here's just a, a snapshot of the uh, butterfly gardening fact sheet that we worked on. I'd like to acknowledge our co-authors, Dr. Fowski and Dr. McGinnis, who also contributed a lot to this fact sheet and putting it together. So the diversity of butterflies is just amazing. There's about 16,000 species in the world. And in North, Dakota, North America, there's about 7,500. And then North Dakota, uh, 161 species. Um, obviously, we're in the northern end of the range for some butterflies. So if we were down in Mississippi, you know, obviously we would have a lot more species. So it's, it's, it's exciting to talk about planting a butterfly garden because uh, they are in, 
having problems now, butterflies as well as, you know, bees. You've probably heard that, um, you know, they're not doing some, so well. I know monarchs have declined 80%, they say, on average. Um, so anything we can do, like planting a butterfly garden, uh, will help. You know, every little bit helps. You know, we're providing nutrition for nectar for the adult, as well as the larvae, which might have a different host than what the uh, butterfly feeds on. So location, 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 just like when you're buying a house, same thing can go to planting your butterfly garden. Uh, they like the more uh, southern areas that are protected from our strong northwest westerly winds that we have here in North Dakota. So, you know, think about things you can do to maybe put some sh in a sheltered area like a fence or some shrubs and trees. That'll help prevent the uh, wind. And also if you provide sheltered locations like piles of uh, brush piles and, you know, if you have room, you know, put a brush pile out. Those types of things will also help provide shelter for the butterflies. And then habitat is the next most critical thing. Um, perches, make sure you have some tall and short flowers or maybe a garden ornament that you can stick out in the garden where they can perch. They need to sun themselves, the adult butterflies. Uh, they need to warm up their body temperature to 85 degrees Fahrenheit before they can take flight and be active and feed. So anything you can do to provide a high point for them to perch on for sunning is, is real important. And then I already mentioned the importance of water and nectar sources, and we'll talk more detail about the nectar sources, flowers. And water though is very critical as well. They need a shallow water dish. And this is a picture I took when I was at the Cincinnati Zoo, uh, the lower right hand corner. It's just a cement, it's nothing fancy, just a cement bowl they made and it's very shallow, but it also gives the butterflies a little bit of area to perch so they can get some water. And then feeders, now they're kind of, um, they're, you can use them as nectar feeders, just like a hum hummingbird feeder. And you can put 10% sugar water solution in there for additional nectar. However, I've put some out and I never have seen really butterflies at them that much. So I know I've heard from some other folks that they don't really work that well. You're better off just putting pieces of fruit, you know, you can cut a banana or apple or other fruits and letting them dry out. But remember, you need to maintain them and not let them go rotten or anything. And the same thing with the feeder, you should clean it out with vinegar at least uh, once a week. So and then mud puddles. Um, they also need salts and minerals, and this is how they get them through mud puddles. So if you have an area where you have a hard pro time growing um, grass, you can go ahead and wet that area when you're watering your flowers, and maybe some butterflies will use it as a mud puddle. Um, a lot of times you see them when you're driving on gravel roads. Uh, there's a lot of butterflies in the mud puddles. And then also you might see them on your dog's doo-doo. Uh, they like that as well for <laughs> salts and minerals. So leave some doo-doos out in the yard. <laughs> um, and then flowers. Of course, that's the number one source for the adult butterflies. And some of the larvae uh, feed on um on flowers, but others need trees or shrubs. It just depends on the species of butterfly. So, and this is a black swallowtail that likes to um, larvae there. 
that likes to feed on dill. And I had this in the yard. I have like a dill pile. I just let it go to seed and every year it comes back. I don't have to do anything. It's great. And I also have dill for the salads and things. Um, and then insecticides. Um, that's a no-no, a big no-no. Try to avoid um, using any sec insecticides at all. In the U US alone, we use over a billion, uh, I think it's gallons of, a billion pounds of insecticides in the U US each year. That's just amazing. Um, that includes not just insecticides, but herbicides and fungicides as well. So and then Dipel, we use that quite commonly for control of like tent caterpillars, forest, the forest service uses them for control of the forest tent caterpillar. But don't use this. This is specific to caterpillars and it also includes not only the pest caterpillars, but our beautiful cat butterfly caterpillars. So try to avoid using any Dipel unless you're spot treating for some tent caterpillars in your trees or something, uh, but avoid using it at, at least on your flowers. It's uh, called BT, is the active ingredient Bacillus thuringiensis. And this is a natural occurring bacterium that's found in the soil worldwide. And it works by the caterpillar ingesting the bacteria on the leaf or the flower and then it would, it's absorbed into the gut and it creates holes in the gut. And this creates a leaky gut that eventually it'll just explode and then it, it kills the insect. So um, this would something you definitely would not want to use as well as all of our insecticides today are broad spectrum. So they're going to kill everything out there, including the other good bugs like lady beetles, surfeit fly larvae, lacewing larvae. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk mainly about flowers today, but remember the trees and shrubs. Um, as I mentioned, many of the larvae like to feed on trees. Um, and so you got to have these as well. And a lot of them are excellent poll pollinators. You can see the unicorn prominent caterpillar that's feeding on a maple tree leaf. This is actually a moth, not a butterfly, but we enjoy the moths as well. And then also this is a, a Canadian tiger swallowtail that's um, feeding on a white li lilac. So there's a lot of um, uh, great um, trees and shrubs out there to plant. And flowers, the main thing we want to do with the flowers is to provide flowers all summer long. And not only will the butterflies enjoy that, but we'll enjoy it as well with all the color. Uh, butterflies are most attracted to the brighter colors, the red, orange, yellow, pink, and purple. Uh, but I have seen them on white flowers as well, since many of the white flowers are very uh, wonderful smelling. They have a strong odor, odor that attracts um, nectar feeders. So some of the early summer flowering perennials that I like are Allium, chives, golden Alexander, and pinks um, or carnations. And we have um, in the fact sheet in table one, I have a list of uh, these uh, ornamentals so you don't have to take a, a lot of notes. And then also uh, for some of the mid flowering, um, <clears throat> there's a uh, the black-eyed Susan, the cat mint, uh, phlox, purple prairie clover, sunflowers, um, quite popular, and it also provides a nice high point for the butterflies to rest on. And bee balm is one of my favorites. 
and Blazing Star, Joe Pie Weed, Purple Coneflower. And be sure you plant a few flowers that have a flat top. Many of the uh, butterflies like to rest on a flat top. It's like a landing surface uh, for when the butterfly comes in, so it makes it easier for them. Uh, and there's many uh, different types of flowers, but I would encourage you to go with natives if you can. Uh, this, these are the plants that the butterflies are used to because they're from North America. So many of the commercial ornamentals flowers are good for pro providing nectars, but they don't always provide a good host plant for that larvae. So use the natives when you can. And the fla fall flowering uh, perennials are goldenrod, asters, sedum, and sneezeweed um, are fairly common. And make sure you, when you're selecting your fall flowering perennials that you get some that start to bloom in September or August. I know some species won't start to bloom until October and sometimes we have a hard frost so those flowers won't bloom and provide much resources. And the fall, fall flowers are the most important because the migratory um, butterflies like the monarch are, need these resources so they can take that long trip to Mexico or California. So and then don't forget about the annuals. I always use them as fillers in my perennial garden because uh, when you first put in the perennial garden it usually takes three years at least until they fill out or longer until they fill out the area that you've given them. So I usually fill in with uh, annuals and my favorites are Cosmos, Lantana, and Xenias. Those are my three. Uh, but they're all wonderful um, flowers. You know, put them in pots as well um, and enjoy the bees and the butterflies that you'll be attracting. And there's, uh, this is also in the publication. Um, of course, milkweeds are very important for the monarch butterfly because they're, they're, they need it in order to complete their life cycle. The larvae must have uh, milkweed in order to uh, survive. And it's, there's many different species. These are the main uh, species uh, that are available and you can usually find them through commercial um, sources of perennial flowers and take a look at the far column to the right where we have soils. Make sure you select one that's adapted uh, to your soil type. Um, butterfly weed is not native but I have seen uh, monarch caterpillar feeding on my milkweed uh, butterfly plant. Um, so it will uh, work and also common milkweed that one is fairly aggressive and can become a little bit of a uh, weedy so you need to give it quite a bit of space uh, two to three square foot so it's also a noxious weed in in certain counties of north dakota uh, cavalier renville sheridan trail and wells county However, it's not listed on the state's uh, noxious weed list for North Dakota. So, and it does well in dry um, soils. You might want to try using uh, the prairie milkweed instead. A uh, showy milkweed is more adapted to the Western states. It's, it looks just like the common milkweed but it's a little bit taller, four feet, and the flowers are actually a lot larger. And then swamp milkweed is good for moist so soils. Um, however, I've been growing mine in, um, I live in a sandy loam soil, so it drains relatively quickly. 
and I've had good luck with it. Um, I only water it once a week if it's dry and we haven't gotten any rain. Uh, but other than that, it, it's done very well in a, in my bed. So I think it's, you can also grow it in probably medium to dry soils. And then world milkweed is one of my favorites. Um, it's a smaller milkweed, so if you're limited on size in your garden, it's only two feet high and it only spreads one, to t uh, one foot about to two feet. So, and it's a beautiful white um, flower. And in the fact sheet, we got uh, table four and we list the different um, sources for the common butterflies of North Dakota. However, there's, you may see them feeding on other things than we listed. This is just what they prefer. It doesn't mean that they won't feed on other things if some of their preferred hosts are not around. So it's just to give you a general idea. And that's listed for quite a few species in the fact sheet. I just show a few, but like if you really want to get the black swallowtail, for example, you know, it shows you some of the plants uh, that you should uh, plant to try and attract a swallowtail, which has a long tongue. So that's the other thing, the nectary sources in some uh, flowers like bee balm, they have uh, deep um, nectar sources. So you need uh, butterflies that have longer tongues to get to them, to those nectar sources. Other plants have smaller or shallower nectar sources and they'll attract some of the more smaller butterflies with shorter tongues, uh, like milkweeds, asters. Um, and a good example, the butterfly with shorter tongues are crescents and hair streaks. So gotta keep that in mind too. Make sure you plan a, a diversity of different types of flowers. So and you generally wanna avoid flowers without nectar because um, they won't attract the bees or the butterflies. However, um, if you have a favorite, you know, go ahead and plant, you know, one or two. Just make sure the, the majority of your flowers are ones that have nectar sources for the butterflies. And the plant over on the right is a good example of a um, flower where the flower parts have been converted to more petals. So that's why you have the pom-pom effect um, on there. So um, just be aware that with some of the ornamental flowers that you might want to purchase, they may look nice, but because they look nice, they had to give up some of the nectar sources when they're doing the breeding. So um, remember your caterpillar host plants uh, is very important because the caterpillars will feed on all different plant parts, uh, leaves, flowers, buds, or the seeds. And when we attract the butterflies to our gardens, we want them to complete their whole life cycle there so we can observe them longer. And so it's good to, you know, pay attention to the different uh, larval food sources that each butterfly needs. So if we look again at our black swallowtail, here you see the dill family is where the caterpillar can develop. So you can grow dill, parsley, carrots, or the alexanders um, as an example. So if you have a favorite butterfly, you know, check into what kind of flowers it likes as the butterfly, and then what kind of plants does the caterpillar need for a host. And there's lots of books out there for identifying butterflies. Uh, these are some of my favorites um, that I've used. Most of them are just picture guides. So you just look at the beautiful color pictures and match them up. And usually there's a, some description 
in the text that you can also read to match that up. <clears throat> and there is a book on butterflies of North Dakota. It was written by Ron Royer, uh, Dr. Ron Royer. He's a professor at Minot State University. He is retired now, but I believe his book is still available. It was completed in 2003. And the nice thing about it is it has uh, nice colored pictures of the butterflies and a map. So you can see where the different butterflies occur in North Dakota. And then I also like the books uh, from the Xerces Society. And this is a new one that's relatively new that came out, Gardening for Butterflies. Um, every winter, I since we have just a long winter here, <laughs> I read a new uh, book on gardening for butterfly, and this is the one I read this past winter. Very good book. Um, as you can imagine, there's lots of uh, websites um, on butterflies as well. Uh, one that is fairly good is the Butterflies and Moths of North America, Bambonia. And there you can see, I took a little snapshot of the website so you can see it and it shows, you can Google, you know, search for your butterfly you're looking for and then see where it, it is, occurs in the North America. So and if you live in a different state, you can zoom in and get some ideas on the location. And then also there's the Xerces Society, and they also have another book out on butterfly gardening, creating summer magic in your gardens. And we do list a few other resources in the fact sheet. Um, so if you're interested in more, uh, please see the fact sheet. And of course, caterpillars are completely different looking than the butterflies. So, <laughs> You need to buy different guides for the caterpillars. And here's two excellent ones. There's, it's just full of color pictures and you can picture match them up. That's the easiest way for the novice to do the um, identification of the larvae. So we're gonna get going on just how to identify some common North Dakota butterflies. And I'll give you some identification hints, a little bit about their habits and their life history and how many are in North Dakota species there are. <clears throat> so we'll get started with the uh, skippers. Uh, they're a, a small to medium sized butterfly and they're generally orange color and they're in the family Hesperiidae and Hesper means evening sun. So when you look at the wing, wings, you can think of the setting sun and the beauty of that. And they have a fairly erratic rapid flight. You can also use that for identification. And also, if you take a look at the head, you can see the antenna are fairly wide spaced apart. They're not close to gather on the head. And I have a close up of that in the next slide. There's about 42 species that occur in North Dakota. And we do have the Dakota skipper, which is on the federal uh, list for threatened butterfly species. And here's the map from Ron Royer's book on butterflies of North Dakota on where it is found. However, Ron's book was published in 2003 and Dr. Fowski is doing some survey work in North Dakota for the Dakota Skipper. And today you're lucky if you find it in only the North Central counties of North Dakota. So as you know, many butterflies are being threatened. Um, and it's, I believe it's primarily due to uh, lack of habitat for either the butterfly and or its caterpillar, you know, the host plants. And then also pesticide use is probably another factor and then global warming. Now the Dakota skipper, the larvae will feed specifically on, it loves uh, little blue stem grass. 
So it's a grass feeder. And we do know that many of the native areas where we had some prairie uh, grass reserves, um, you know, there's not very many left that are not disturbed. So and here's some more examples of some other species we have here in North Dakota. And you can see a close up of the antenna hook. A lot of them have hooks um, at the end of the uh, antenna. And then the caterpillars, they have a distinct constriction or neck behind the head. So there's many different um, colors and forms, but one of the other things you might notice is that they construct a sil silken tube or shelter uh, where they hide during the day. So if they're feeding on broadleaf plants, you know, it'll be, they'll pull the leaves together. If they're grass feeder, they're usually down at the base of the plant. And most of our resident skippers will overwinter as eggs larvae or chrysalis. Hey, this is uh, everyone's favorite, the swallowtails, Papilionidae. Papilio is Latin for butterfly. Uh, most of these are very large to large butterflies. And they often have a tail on the end of the hind wing. If you look at the Canadian tiger swallowtail, you can see there's one small tail on the hind wing and another um, larger one there. So, but that is characteristic of this group. And there's about nine species that occur here in North Dakota. Okay, the larvae. Uh, larvae, have a unique organ. It's a Y-shaped reversible structure called the osmotarium and it's displayed when the butterfly or the caterpillar is threatened. So it's used as a defensive structure that's located behind the head and it's supposed to resemble a snake's tongue and it also releases a pungent odor as a defensive mechanism. So you can see uh, the pupa of the this swallowtails, they rest with the head up and there's also a silken strand that is attaches them to the plant that they're over, that the chrysalis is formed on. They overwinter as chrysalis in North Dakota. Okay, the sulfurs in white. Uh, this is the one where the European sulfur uh, originated in, or is classified in the Pyridae. So and that's where the, the word butterfly came from. So most of these are yellow, orange, or white, as the name implies. There's about 14 species in North Dakota and 65 in North America. And you might recognize some of these, like the cabbage butterfly, as a pest in your garden. They will feed, the caterpillar will feed on your uh, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, cauliflower, and other uh, brookaceae plants. And here's some that aren't in North Dakota, just to show you the diversity. And the larvae are typically uh, have tiny hairs on them. And it kind of gives them a velvety like appearance. And then the larvae will form a chrysalis with its head pointed upwards. And it also has the silken strap in the middle, almost like a windows washer belt. And they overwinter as the chrysalis. Moving on to the glossomer winged butterfly, they're small to mid medium sized butterflies. This is one of my favorite groups and they're very beautiful. Uh, a lot of them are blue in color um, and they're very uh, small. But if you have one, if you're 
collecting butterflies as a hobby for your collection and you have one in hand, if you take a close look at the eye, you'll see it's touching the base of the antenna and I have the blue arrow there pointing to that. So there's about 29 species in North Dakota. And the larvae um, of many are kind of slug-like. And here's some more different species. The summer azure is one of my favorites. Beautiful. And here's the slug-like larvae. Um, they are tended by ants and they have a symbiotic relationship. The larvae secrete a sugary liquid called honeydew and the ants feed on that. And in turn, the ants will protect the caterpillars from insect predators. So um, that's a beneficial symbiotic relationship. And you can see that the larvae in some species also might have a little bit of minute hairs to them. So that's pretty common and they feed on buds, flowers, or seeds. Many different um, forms in the larval stage. Okay, and then we'll move to the Nymphalidae. Uh, there's quite a few different uh, uh, groups, so kind of break them down. These are the brush-footed butterflies. And if you take a close look, you'll see in the lower right picture, the front leg is reduced and not used at all except for cleaning their eyes or antenna and tasting the flowers. So you'll see them walking around on only four legs. And as you know, most adult insects have six legs. And there's about 54 species that occur here in North Dakota. And we're gonna break this group down into uh, seven smaller groups. And the larvae have typically have spines on them. And for the chrysalis, they hang with the head down. And they're attached, you can see that little darkened uh, structure where it's attached to the plant, that's called a cremaster. And that's a, attached how they're, you can identify this group, Nymphalidae. So the fritillaries, uh, they're medium to large size butterflies and typically uh, beautiful uh, black and orange. And I you'll notice some um, in the variegated fritillary and the great spangled fritillary that the wing on the right is separated. That means it's the underside of that wing. And over on the left is the top side. So when you see it separated, that's just showing you the underside of the wing. Um, the larvae are very specific to violets, so be sure you put some prairie violets in your garden if you want these species. The regal fritillary is just beautiful. Uh, there's about 11 here in North Dakota. Next is the checker spots and crescents. Uh, they're a small, medium-sized butterfly and typically orange and black, similar to the fritillaries. But if you look at the edge of the wing or the margins, they have solid black wing margins. And the antenna clubs are a little bit more, if you were looking at them closely with a hand lens, you'd see they're more spatulate or spoon-shaped. And there's about eight species here in North Dakota. Angle winged and tortoise shells, they're medium to large size butterflies and their wing margin is usually scalped, kind of gives it a ragged appearance. And many of them are brightly col colored above, but the hind wings are not and they often look like uh, tree bark or dried leaves. And these insects or butterflies are attracted to the tree sap so they don't feed on the nectar flowers. 
um, and in the summer they feed on fermenting fruit into the fall and there's about 10 species here. Here's some others and here you can see in the comma you can see the top picture the underside of that wing and you can see how much that looks like a dried leaf or bark and in fact uh, the morning cloak butterfly can live up to a year because it's one of the few butterflies that will overwinter as a butterfly in North Dakota and it overwinters under the bark of trees. Okay, the thistle butterflies, they're medium size and usually have bright colors and the underside of the wing has some eye spots. I hope you can see that in the lower picture. It's a little bit dark, but most of them have eye spots and those are used as a defensive mechanism to scare away predators. And you can see the thistle uh, caterpillar will curl the leaves together, would web them together as they feed on them. And this is actually a pest of our soybeans and sunflowers. So the painted lady also migrates up into North Dakota and does not winter here. There's about four species in North Dakota. The um, admirals butterflies are large with bold, bold patterns. And they don't have a very strong antennal club. You can see it's very small. And they usually, in their flight, they have a circling pattern and a flat wing glide. There's only three species primarily in North Dakota besides the two pictured here, the Viceroy and Ra white and migral and the red spotted purple is the third one. And moving on to the milkweed butterflies, these are large size with orange wings and the black veins and we have just the monarch in this group in North Dakota. And they um, are pretty easy to identify so I won't spend much time on that. But you might notice the flight of monarchs. They have, um, you know, vigorously flap and then they have a long glide. And they have a typical V shape too when they're doing the gliding. And then we have some mimicry going on here with the viceroy. Uh, so it's mimicking the monarch because the monarch is toxic due to some of the toxins they imbibe as a caterpillar feeding on the milkweed. So, and it's used as a defensive mechanism. Most birds know that the monarch is not very tasteful and will avoid them. And the monarch will take advantage, or the viceroy takes advantage of that. And then the satras or the brush-footed butterflies, uh, they're medium size and they're kind of dull colors, brown or orange. And they often have the eye spots on their wing surfaces, which again are used to surprise predators that might be trying to feed on them. And if you look at the top picture, you'll see the uh, swollen vein at the base of the forewing. And this functions as an ear in butterflies. They overwinter as partially grown larvae or less commonly as eggs. There's about 11 species of um, this group in North Dakota. And in the fact sheet, there's a calendar of the butterflies of North Dakota and when we typically see them. And you can tell which species have multiple generations. You, you'll see several times when they come out, usually early in the year and then later in the summer. So with that, I'd like to conclude and thank you for your attention. And I hope um, that you will help these butterflies out by providing them with plots of beautiful flowers and other nectar sources. Uh, we consider flowers, you know, beauty for us but they're food for many 
butterflies and bees as well. And I'd like to show you the blue morpho butterfly. This is from Central and South America. And down there, they believe if one lands on you, you'll have good luck. So that's what I would like to leave with you is some good luck. Well, thank you very much for a very interesting and informative seminar. Does anyone have any questions? You can go ahead and type those in your chat, in the chat box, and I will say them to Janet. Any questions? I know that I am inspired to go out and buy myself a book on getting more butterflies in my yard. Yes, it's, it's um, just amazing how much information is out there. And every time I, I read a book, I learn uh, something new about them. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not seeing any I'm letting you off the hook here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that's fine, too. <laughs> Uh, please, um, anyone listening, be aware that the, well, there is a question that just popped oh, in. Oh, okay. Um, someone is talking about planting a lilac bush. Well, and I'll ask uh -huh. the question, does that attract butterflies? Uh, yes, uh, they will feed on the nectar of lilac. Um, it's, and I believe there's some, uh, there's also some larvae that will use it as a host plant as well. And I haven't memorized all this stuff, so I usually go to a table, <laughs> our table, and look at it to, you know, f figure out which one. But, um, uh, yeah, I've seen quite a few uh, butterflies um, on lilac, and I also use them around my butterfly garden for shelter, so it breaks the wind uh, from the uh, flower garden. And someone posts a good tip, discoverbooks.com may be a good source for finding reasonable used butterfly books, usually about $4. Okay. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I know uh, that golden guide book I got for $1.95, but I think they're a little more expensive now. That was, you know, maybe 20 years ago, <laughs> maybe oh. about five or six dollars now. Well, with that, I will just thank all our participants. And uh, oh, please, oh, there's, there is a new question. Where does a chrysalis overwinter? Well, project? that's a good question. Um, they can, it depends on the butterfly species, but, you know, they can be anywhere. They can be um, in the brush pile. They can be on a tree limb. They can even, I've seen chrysalis overwintering on fences. Um, <clears throat> so usually they try to do it uh, someplace where they're somewhat cryptic uh, so predators don't eat them. But uh, yeah, it's usually, it's not in the soil or anything. So they're usually, sometimes they're attached to the flowers and you'll find them. I found uh, chrysalis of monarch on my milkweed. So it just, it just depends on sometimes the caterpillars too will crawl off and I don't know where they go but um, I don't find them on the milkweed. <laughs> uh, yeah with the cold temperatures it is surprising they freeze but insects are very adaptive that way. They slow down their body temperature and they have a chemical in them that is very similar to antifreeze so it prevents them from freezing and dying. So I think that was the last of the questions. So again, I thank you and I hope everyone joins us next week and for the next three weeks. And please check out all the Field to Fork resources. I think you'll find a lot more information on many topics and I hope it inspires you to garden and also cook. So thank you again, Janet. And yeah, thank you. And thanks everybody.